So we're just gonna give a few minutes for people to join in and then we'll get started. You are joining the Toronto Island Master Plan Forum entitled Towards Belonging. Thank you, Laurie. I am pleased and honored to be here today to speak on behalf of parks, forestry and recreation. Toronto Island is a special park to many people and it is important that we frame the master plan wisely. So ultimately to be more accessible to all people. Fostering a sense of belonging for the island visitors is an important step in this process. No one would argue that as human beings, all we want to belong. Belonging is essential to our humanity. We are hardwired for connection. Connection reinforces our sense of belonging, which positively impacts our overall health and well being. So, what does it mean to belong? Belonging is a feeling that extends beyond inclusion. Belonging is something altogether different. Belonging is centered on tolerance, mutual respect, the sharing of experiences, and the celebration of the ways we are unique and different as well as our similarities. In today's cities, parks offer a unique and special place to explore this sense of belonging. Parks act as a fabric that weave our city together, connecting one natural area to another or one neighborhood to another to create a, create a rich network of shared spaces that support our daily lives. A city without parks would be like a city without a soul, a city without connections, a city without community, in Toronto, the city within a park, more than 1,500 parks have been and continue to be focal points, serving as the hearts of our communities. Parks are places where we go to meet up with friends, to play, to relax, to escape, to celebrate, and so much more. Over the last 20 months, the importance of parks in our city has been magnified. Torontonians have demonstrated their strength and resilience to persevere through the stress, anxiety, grief, and loneliness that has been brought on by this pandemic. To the larger number of Toronto residents who live in homes without access to outdoor spaces, parks have become their backyards, providing safe places to meet with others in the open air, allowing us to feel some sense of normal life despite all the limitations that social distancing has placed on us. For so many of us, parks have become an integral part of our day to day where our strong sense of belonging drives our desire to keep going back to spend more time there. Unfortunately, this is not true for everyone. Some of us don't feel a sense of belonging in our parks. Sometimes parks feel like they are places for other people, for someone else. For example, for some of us, when we see places dominated by a bunch of other people playing sports we don't understand or maybe we don't care about, we don't feel like we belong. When we pass by an open air market and don't have any money to spend, uh, we don't feel like we belong. Or when we reach a park entrance only to find a long set of stairs with no way to navigate our wheelchair, we don't feel like we belong. When we are out in parks being joyful with our friends and face complaints or harassment by other park users because of the color of our skin or where we come from or who we love, we don't feel like we belong. And when we don't see ourselves reflected in a place that we have known for thousands of years, we don't feel like we belong. So despite our parks being open, free and largely accessible spaces, they don't always foster a sense of belonging. This forum is intended to expand our awareness of the importance of belonging in our parks, to get us thinking about the key ingredients needed to help foster that sense of belonging for everyone, to ensure Toronto Island Park and parks across the city are truly welcoming, safe and accessible to all. And with, all, and with that, I would like to hand it over to Galila Mikkonen to begin the forum. Thank you so much for those opening remarks, uh, Laurie and Donna, I really appreciate it. And thank you to the team for organizing this wonderful forum. Um, before we get started, I'd like to again, welcome everyone who is watching from wherever you may be on this kind of a chilly Thursday evening. Uh, welcome, we're excited to engage you in this conversation about moving towards belonging in our parks and our public spaces. Um, although of course, some of our conversation tonight will be anchored in and around the Toronto Island, this forum is really intended to have a broader conversation about belonging 
parking in all of our parks and our public spaces throughout the city. Um, so we welcome any of your ideas and contributions and questions um, throughout this forum, uh, wherever they may be in the city. And um, Galila, so sorry to interrupt you. I just, if I could, I would uh, like to offer a land acknowledgement before we get into the body of the, um, of the forum, if that is okay with you. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so I would like to offer a land acknowledgement to honor Indigenous peoples, the land, the water, and the territory, and more specifically today, to recognize the Indigenous significance of Toronto Island and the importance of belonging. Toronto Island is many things to many different people. People travel to the island for different reasons and engage in many different activities when they explore the different spaces when they are there. We have learned that it is a place with deep meaning to the Indigenous community as a meeting place, a place for healing, and a place for ceremony. Through the Toronto Island Master Plan process, we are looking to build trust and new relationships towards exploring meaningful opportunities for placekeeping and reconciliation at Toronto Island Park to ensure a sense of belonging is fostered. The places that we are joining from today are on lands that are part of the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, including Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. I would like also to take a moment to acknowledge the ever-chaining lands of the Toronto Islands, as well as the lake and waterways that surround it, with waves and currents forever shaping and reshaping the island's shores, giving life and richness to the island and creating the diverse habitats, flora, fauna, and unique environments that we experience when we visit. Toronto Island is a unique and special place with Indigenous significance that means many different things to many people. Tonight, we look forward to expanding our thinking and understanding of belonging to ensure that we can embed this thinking deeply, more deeply into the master plan process to ensure that the park will be a place for everyone and to feel safe and welcome for years to come. So before we begin, I would just like to uh, uh, extend a sincere welcome to everyone for joining this evening. And we understand how precious and personal time is, and we are very appreciative of the fact you have chosen to be here tonight. This forum is being recorded, which um, many of you may have noticed as you came into the meeting. And that is for those who have been able, unable to join us tonight, or for those who would like to watch it later by visiting our, our uh, Toronto Island Master Plan website. Um, you will notice also that we have uh, turned on the automated live captions so that as people are speaking, you will see their words being transcribed on the bottom of the screen. These live captions are not always 100% accurate as we're, as we're doing them live, but before we upload the video to our website, we will uh, ensure that those are made accurate and uh, reflective of the event this evening. And finally, for those of you who provided your email when you registered, uh, you will be added to our project contact list. And if you do not want to receive project updates, or um, please email Jackie from our engagement team at jli at swern.com. And I'll, I'll spell it jli at swerhun.com. So the forum we have convened tonight will explore what it means to move towards belonging from the different perspectives of different park users. Toronto Island forums are, sp are spaces that are being inc included in the master plan process to hear from thought leaders, artists, and experts about their ideas and inspirations that we hope will be able to integrate into the thinking of the master plan to shape the future of Toronto's signature waterfront park. As Part of the Toronto Island Master Plan's uh, engagement process, the city is hosting three forums. The first forum of the series was hosted back in April, 2021 and focused 
on indigenous placekeeping as a way of recognizing the island as an indigenous place and to center the project's commitment to reconciliation. The second forum in the series, which is what we are here tonight for, is framed towards belonging and will center on ideas and thinking around the theme of belonging in the recognition of the fact that not all members of our community feel like they belong in our parks, to reiterate the importance of park spaces for all people, and to learn about how we can make our parks, and in particular Toronto Island Park, a place where everyone truly does feel like they belong. A third forum will be offered in 2022, and more details will be shared in the spring of next year. The forum tonight, and I know Galila ha had already started, but I'm doing a little bit of a backup and sort of apologies for that, um, uh, uh, Galila, but the forum tonight will be moderated by Galila Mikonen. Galila uses the pronouns she and her and is a planner with diverse, a diverse background in community engagement, active transportation and public realm projects. With a keen interest in community co-creation and intercultural collaboration, Galila is, a pa is passionate about understanding different approaches to city building practices. Galila is currently the planning coordinator at the Bentway, where she was, a, uh, was previously a public space fellow, having completed her master's uh, in planning and urban development at X University. Galila has also worked on research and projects related to micro, sorry, micro mobility in Toronto. As an inquisitive planner, she brings her passion for social equity and community capacity building in all her work and strives to build reciprocal relationships that foster communal learning. We also have an amazing lineup of guest speakers, Yuma uh, Dean Hester, Jacqueline Scott, Jen Roberton, Kofi and Kofi Hope, who will share their insights towards belonging. And I will let Galila introduce each of them in more detail in just a few minutes. But before I hand over the floor, I would like to give you a, a little bit of background on the insights into the master plan process and some highlights related to belonging that we have heard to date. The master plan process was initiated in fall 2020, and there are three key phases to the work. Phase one, towards belonging. Phase two, testing ideas. And phase three, confirming a path forward. Currently, we are nearing the end of phase two. To date, we have completed extensive engagement, including conversations with various advisory committees, the public and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Indigenous rights holders, the urban Indigenous community, youth and the city's accessibility Com committee. We have listened and learned many important things from these conversations and will continue to engage and actively listen to continue the, to inform the master plan as it evolves to become the final master plan in the summer of 2022. We are pleased that you have joined us this evening to expand the thinking and to continue the conversation. Through the Toronto Island master plan process, we have heard that Toronto Island Park is a cherished place to many people and that many people go there for many different reasons, but most importantly, as an escape from the city, as a place to recharge to explore and have fun. We have learned that the theme of belonging is important too. For example, a number of participants told us that it is important to ensure that the island is welcoming for all, for people of all ages and abilities. We also need to acknowledge and celebrate the importance of Hanlon's Beach as a safe, inclusive queer space, and that all the beaches, all the island beaches, need to be accessible to everyone, both from land and water perspectives. We have also learned that the island is not accessible to all people and not everyone feels like they belong or can see themselves there. And we have heard that the distance to get there and the costs for travel, including the ferry, can be too high for some people. That it can be difficult to navigate such large spaces with no on-site on-island transportation that is accessible to people of all ages and abilities. That the lack of really good wayfinding means knowing where to go and what amenities and activities are available can be challenging. And we have also learned that the island is not always a safe place and as welcoming as we would like it to be. So early next year, we will be leading another round of extensive engagement. 
please visit our project webpage, toronto.ca slash islandmasterplan for more detailed information on engagement outcomes to date and updates and notices for future engagements through 2022. And now I will hand it back over to Galila and you can pick up where you left off. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you so much. Uh, perfect. I think now that I've had my introduction, I think we should go straight into introducing our four wonderful panelists for tonight. Uh, and I'll start with introducing Jacqueline L. Scott. Uh, Jacqueline, hopefully your, your uh, camera's on so you can give a little wave. Uh, Jacqueline is a PhD student at the University of Toronto in social justice education, uh, where her research is on the perception of wilderness and the Black imagination. Uh, in other words, how can the outdoor recreation and the broader environmentalism uh, be more accessible for Black Canadians? Uh, Jacqueline is a writer and she's also an, an avid outdoor fan. So welcome, Jacqueline. Next up, we have Jen Roberton. Uh, Jen is an urban planner focusing on equitable access to zero emissions transportation. Jen has a master's degree in planning from the University of British Columbia, uh, where their research focused on creating safe public spaces for LGBTQ communities. They also have a bachelor's degree from the University of Toronto, and they're also certified uh, with the American Institute of Certified Planners. Jen previously spent five years working in sustainable transportation in public service at the City of New York and the City of Toronto. And prior to this, she worked at, uh, in the nonprofit sector, providing resources for community members to learn bicycle repair. Jen recently accepted an offer to join Sam Schwartz Engineering as senior planner and looks forward to continuing to advocate for greater access to transportation. Jen currently lives in New York City, uh, where they can be seen riding their bike uh, to the beach and studying for their Arabic classes. Very cool. Welcome, Jen. Next up, we have Kofi Hope. Kofi is a Rhodes Scholar and has a doctorate in politics from Oxford University. He is the co-founder of Monumental, and he writes a monthly opinion column for the Toronto Star newspaper and is an Emiratus Bousfield scholar, uh, scholar and adjunct professor at U of T's School of Geography and Planning. He also serves as a senior fellow at the Wellesley Institute and as a board member at the Atkinson Foundation. In 2017, he was the winner of the Jane Jacobs Prize and in 2018, a rising star in Toronto Life's Power List. Kofi was a co-founder and former executive director uh, of a charity CEE uh, Center for Young Black Professionals. Welcome Kofi. Finally, we have Yuma Dean Hester, half Anishinaabe, Yeshingming, and half Cree, Moose Factory. Yuma has spent the better part of the last 20 years working in community development, working, with consult working in consultation with over 30 First Nations communities. He specializes in consultation and facilitation skills, relationship development, open and effective communication, and solutions-oriented discussion. Currently a founding member and creative director of the Wadden Collective, Yuma, along with a diverse group of indigenous artists and accomplices, work collaboratively to develop their approaches to modern artistic storytelling and film production processes. It is their goal uh, to constantly adjust organizational structures and modes of storytelling to create inclusive, uh, mindful spaces that better represent indigenous peoples in the mainstream. Welcome Yuma. So with that said, uh, each panelist will have about 10 to 15 minutes to present uh, or speak uh, and share their insights and contributions uh, around the discussion of encouraging belonging in public spaces. And importantly, uh, we'll also be able to discuss uh, how the city might be able to embed this thinking in the Toronto Island Master Plan to create a park that's truly open and accessible and welcoming for everyone. Uh, so I'm just as excited as everyone watching to listen directly from the speakers. So with that said, and without further ado, I'll welcome back Yuma, uh, who will be our first presenter for this evening. So Yuma, whenever you are ready, the floor is yours. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, yes, my name is Yuma Hester. Uh, I'm based here in, in Hamilton. Um, and as previously mentioned, I'm half Anishinaabe from Nashingman, which is up in the shores of uh, the Georgian Bay. And the other half is um, Cree or Iluwak from uh, the mouth of the James Bay Moose Factory. Um, 
but my grandparents came over from the Quebec side, uh, from Wiskaganish to eventually form Mo-Quebec. Um, I want to thank Waterfront BIA, uh, the City of Toronto Parks, Recreation and Forestry, um, and most importantly, uh, the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, uh, whom without I wouldn't be here this evening. Um, and through our collective work, we um, were commissioned to put together a, a video. Um, and the way we you know the way we go about been, like creating and developing concepts is uh, heavily reliant on you know, um, the history that we have of community development um, consultation as well um, some of my credentials were listed before but there are other uh, members of our collective that also share um, a lot of these skills and abilities as well um, so yeah i wish to express sincere veneration to Mississauga, the Credit First Nation, massive, massive miigwech uh, to Darren Waibenga and Margaret Salt for their supreme trust and generosity. Um, and yeah, as mentioned before, our approach to the research and the development uh, and the concept of this video uh, was led by our combined understanding of community engagement, best practices with Indigenous partners and First Nations. Um, and yeah, I don't want to take up too, too much time or space. Um, I believe that the video kind of speaks for itself. Um, and I think what I would like to ask, though, when you're watching the video, uh, I'd, I'd say listen, listen for the, the calls to action um, and just hear kind of uh, what that authentic voice of, of what uh, Darren and, and Margaret are, are saying. and. Um, kind of what they're uh, very, very directly and plainly asking for. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to throw it to Ian. Um, are you there, Ian? All right. Yes, I've got the video up now. Thanks. I love the power of water and of course water is always very important to to our people you know and here's water showing its destructive power with eating away at the scarborough bluffs and its creative power at the same time of building this peninsula i go and sit in the teachings i go sit um when they bring speakers in to talk about the creation story I marvel at those things, and then you can line up history with those things, right? And I think if if the young people learn that early, then they're going they're going to be a more whole person. When they say surrender, they may surrender the land, but they didn't they didn't surrender their interest in the land. To me, the biggest piece is the is the real truth land acknowledgements to me are nice they're they do acknowledge the original peoples of the land but to me they're dangerous nowadays and that they're just becoming rote anymore people just memorize them i'm on the traditional territory and treaty lands of the mississauga the credit for da, 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 without understanding why they're saying those words uh, without understanding the history behind them. So I think that's a bit of a, of a problem. And they don't understand why, for example, is it called the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas, as opposed to the tradition, uh, the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and the, uh, the Haudenosaunee, for example. So I think there's those things. People have to be more educated about the history. Uh, and I think there's also has to be some education. We've never left those lands. We're still on the land that we occupied 
come to occupy seven, uh, 1,700 years ago. We've never left. We're still on that territory. And people forget that we still have a stake. I challenge anyone to read one of our treaties, anyone, and say that it robbed us of our role of stewardship, that it robbed us of our rights to hunt, to fish, to gather, to be sustained in general by our lands. And I think that uh, it's not in the treaties. It's never, we've never extinguished those rights. So I think that's something people have to be mindful of. Either modern people in Toronto, yes, you've covered it over with concrete, you've put buildings up and so on, but that does not abrogate our rights to be sustained by our land. And some of the responsibility in paving over that land and developing it is helping the First Nations achieve greater sustainability from those lands. My name is Darren Wybanga. I'm the traditional knowledge and land use coordinator for the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. Much of what I do is relaying the history of the First Nation to people that want to do projects in the territory. My name's Margaret Salt, and I'm the Director of Research Lands and Membership at the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. I've been there since 1977. When they say like treaties, they made treaties. There's a misconception from the British or the settlers point to what the First Nations thought they were doing. So they, the First Nations, thought that it was rent um, for being able to travel through their lands. It was for peace and friendship so they could travel through their lands, or it was sharing of resources. So they didn't know the concept of what a treaty was. So that was an early one, 1787. There was language barrier, um, and they had no concept of land ownership. So they were really at a disadvantage and, and uh, feel that the British Crown just took advantage because of all the things they were doing, um, putting rules in place of how they would take surrenders with a royal proclamation. When they surrendered um, tr the Toronto Purchase, when they did that, the islands weren't in included because they went, it was when they went and asked Sir John Johnson what, what it was, what did, they, what did you get from the Mississaugas in 1787? And he said a 10-mile square, two miles on each side of the carrying place, two to four miles, he says, right up to Lake Simcoe. And then at Lake Simcoe, there was another 10-mile square. So they went far beyond their boundaries um, on there. So right now, it's a 14 by 28, and it should have been a 10 by 10. So that's... 250,000 extra acres that they got that they never paid for. But back uh, when we first came to occupy the land, about give or take 1,700, you know, Toronto Islands, there, there were some healing properties there that our people discovered and found work for them. So and they would go and bring uh, the sick to go and get some healing there. Uh, and that's amazing in itself. Here's this piece of landscape out in Lake Ontario that people used to bring the sick to and they used to go and recuperate. They found, in the 1700s anyway, something appealing about the location, something appealing about the climate, the weather. And it was really, I would say, a sacred spot for our people where they could engage in ceremony and uh, get in contact with the, the Manitous or the, the spirits. First Nations want to get back to where they were before. As the nationhoods, um, like Mississaugas of the Credit are part of the Mississauga Nation that entered those treaties. So to get back as a people, um, to, take those, to take their lives back the way it have, should have been and deal with us on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. We've really got to look at preserving what we can, and anytime development does occur, I'm making sure it's done in, in the most proper way to, to preserve what we have and not harm the environment anymore. And if we can ever do anything that improves the environment and looks after what's there, so be it, Let, let's do it.
I would like them to keep a part of it in its natural state and let the animals come back, let the fish come back and uh, um, try and make that a, as it should have been. This is a hope now that the Mississaugas of the Credit will one day find themselves a piece of waterfront in the vicinity of Toronto and restore our spiritual, cultural, physical relationship to the land and waters of that region. Our responsibility is protection and preservation because we were given the task to uh, stewards of the land. You know, so I think the First Nations has a duty to make sure those things keep in place, um, that we can have a say and, and things that are going on in the, in the development, whether it be like fishing or, or anything like, like um, the nuclear plants, any of the big plants of what they put in the water and stuff, because you know what? The water is, is the life. I think they have to go back to the traditional ways and go back to the elders that know those things. The way things were, how to look after things. And I think if they do traditional knowledge, which they talk about, that actually incorporate traditional knowledge in their decisions of when they're doing things. Um, yeah, no, thank you very much um, for watching that video. Um, and just before I hand it uh, back to Galila, I just wanted to, um, again, pay my respects and massive thanks to, to Darren, to Margaret, uh, to the Mississauga, the Credit First Nation, um, and as well as um, just share a little bit more if you're keen or you're interested in hearing more authentic Indigenous voices, um, we have a weekly web series via the Bulwadden Collective YouTube channel. Um, and I just wanted to implore everybody to uh, subscribe, um, check out some of the stuff. There's basically an Indigenous lineup, or sorry, an international lineup of Indigenous artists and settler artists creating um, short films every week. Um, so yeah, thanks very much. And uh, I'll hand it back over to Galila now. Thank you so much, Yuma. That was quite a beautiful video, um, quite inspiring. Um, so next up, I'd like to welcome Jacqueline. Um, so Jacqueline, if you are present, yes, there you are. Um, the floor is now yours. Okay, thank you very much. And could we start the presentation, please? Okay, so thanks to the organizers for inviting me here. And Toronto Islands is one of my favorite places for outdoor recreation, for chilling. And when Caribana used to happen on the island, it was also one of the best places to hang out. I'm an avid outdoor fan, went back to school, and my research is really prompted by trying to understand why in all the decades of doing outdoor recreation, hiking, camping, canoeing, skiing, um, you name it, but there were few, I met few other black people and I wanted to try and find out why. And outdoor recreation is one of the key pathways to things like conservation, ecology and the climate crisis discussions. The research is relevant because prior to COVID, when you looked at the social media in terms of outdoor recreation, black people were glaringly absent from those images. It's also relevant because of what happened to Christian Cooper. Um, he experienced the example of birding while black in New York Central Park. And it was a life-threatening incident because it occurred around about the same time that George Floyd was murdered by the police and Breonna was, Taylor was murdered by the police. So here's a black man in nature doing an activity that is free for everyone. And yet still he was threatened with the police being called on him. Next slide, please. 
And in view of that wonderful video, um, my little land acknowledgement is to point out the long Indigenous presence in Toronto and other places as recorded in everyday objects like the street names, like the historical plaques, which are now doing a better job of acknowledging that Indigenous history and Indigenous presence, and also in the murals that we see every day. And in the case of Toronto Islands, the absence of those over on the island. Next, please. Now, my research is built on three things. It's looking at how race, place, and nature, how they intersect in Canada. Now, in nature, the birds are real, the trees are real, and so are the rivers, so are the rivers. However, how we relate to them is socially constructed. And what I mean by that is that our abuse of nature, it really is shaped by power and by relationships in society. And in Canada, we are the land of the great outdoors, the great white north. And if you think of those marvelous group of seven paintings, this is what they show. Think of all those tourism and marketing images, this is what they show. But what we don't talk about is how the very national parks, the conservation areas, how, were, how they were created by dispossessing indigenous people of their land. And we also don't talk about historically in the um, outdoor recreation imagination, it is white people who are seen as the guardians of the land. It is white people who are seen as the one who naturally belong in such spaces. And when black people show up, oh, surprise, what are you doing here? And so my research is probing those relationships. Next slide, please. Now, Toronto is a majority minority city, meaning that 55% of the population are Black, Indigenous, or people of color. And a quick test that um, we often use is that if the people visiting your parks, the conservation areas, the eco schools, all those environmental days activities, if they don't look like the people that you typically see, see on a Toronto subway, then that's a pretty good indicator that there are barriers in their way. Prior to COVID again, if you think of the media around outdoor recreation, environmentalism, or the climate crisis, or visitors to Toronto Islands, except for Caribana, who did you see in those images? From an academic perspective, it created a kind of visual apartheid because typically the people that you would see in those areas were white. It reinforced the idea that when it comes to nature, when it comes to outdoor activities, it's a white thing done by white people in white spaces. COVID has entirely flipped the switch. One of the outcome of that is the massive increase in people of color using outdoor spaces, including Toronto Islands. And now you're seeing more of us in the social media images of the various organizations. And that is really a good thing, but, if it only stops there, then it just smells of typical tokenism. So it's around, who do you see on staff? If you're over at Toronto Islands, if you're in the Parks, Forestry and Recreation Department, if you're in environmental organizations, what do the staff look like? Do they reflect Toronto's diversity? And when you go to the boardrooms, what do the staff look like there as well? Again, staff or volunteers, do they reflect Toronto's diversity? And if they don't, it perpetuates the power and the privilege and reinforces the idea that when it comes to outdoor recreation, it's a white thing. Um, next slide, please. So in the Canadian context, black people are written out of the environmental history. And when we are mentioned, it's usually in terms of Harriet Tubman and the trek to freedom in Canada. And uh, I'll just speak a little bit about Harriet Tubman. So we're used to thinking of her as quite rightly as the civil rights leader, the equivalent of the Black Lives Matter leader. But from an outdoor recreation perspective, she was also a phenomenal um, backwoods woman in terms of the skill that she had in order to read the landscape for the number of treks that she made, going different routes, hiking over parts of the Appalachian trails, 
um, her ability to survive in winter because typically the slaves would leave in the winter and at night because you gave you a longer head start against a slave catcher but you're using multiple different routes. And in order to do that, you have must have phenomenal skills in order to be able to read the land and figure out where to go. And if anyone has ever tried navigating by the night, um, by following the North Star and at night, um, it takes a lot of courage to do that. Next slide, please. So representation does matter in outdoor recreation in places like Toronto Islands. It matters in the signage, it matters in the trail maps, it matters in the brochures, it matters in the staff who you see on the ground. Because for black people, for people of color, if you don't see others like yourself trying new activities, it creates a kind of negative feedback loop that you're unlikely to try it. And so the more people of color that you see in those jobs, then the more it's like, okay, if they can do that, I can try it. If I'm not sure, I can ask. And when I ask, it's gonna be, oh, you don't know, as opposed to getting the look, the white gaze, which says, oh, what are you doing here? And next slide, please. And in order to encourage more Black people to use the Toronto Islands, and we do use it in terms of Caribana, but if you look, people are not exploring the outer islands, partly because there's no maps telling them there's actually more than Centre Island, there are places you can go to. So without maps, in an area where you're unfamiliar, you're unlikely to go there and try it. Um, so the lack of maps, the lack of signage, the lack of trails, and so the Toronto Islands is an opportunity there to create some of those placemaking things that would make black people comfortable. And of course, the number one, from my perspective, it's also about having black people on staff. And next please. And very quickly, I've done a few interviews and written up some of the research, um, I've done interviews and what I find interesting is that if you look at the various um, newspaper reports on interviews and research that I've done, it's the comments that's really intriguing because the comments show the massive gap between what the research is saying about the lived experience of black people in outdoor recreation and the old image that, well, it's nature, it's free, anybody can go. That's not the reality for black people. And the next slide, please. And one of the things that is happening because of COVID is that Black people, other people of color, they are tired of waiting for white organizations to change. So instead, they have used social media to find each other and to organize their own events. So there's been a massive increase in the number of hiking groups that are run by people of color for people of color. A lot of these groups, they're grassroots, they lack funding, they lack resources, but they're tired of waiting for white organizations to notice them. And because of COVID, because of the huge number of people of color who are in the ravines, who are going over to Toronto Islands and exploring the hidden recesses of it, it does present a magnificent opportunity for Toronto Islands, for um, the managers of the ravine to actually build on that and to make Black people feel welcome in those spaces. Sometimes I get the feeling that they're hoping that we're gonna go away, but we're not. We've discovered the secret places. We've discovered the hidden gems. We have discovered how much we desperately need nature and nature needs us too. So we're not gonna go away. So it's for the organizations to build on the groundswell that's already there. And the last slide. Okay, so that's just some contact information. And part of what motivates me about this work, it's about reclaiming the black presence in the Canadian wilderness, in the Canadian nature. We have been here for 400 years. There's 400 of black history in the outdoors here. So it's about reclaiming that. And also, I think all of us recognize now that there is no planet B. 
with the climate crisis, it needs a diversity of voices at the table to figure out solutions. And because we already know from the climate crisis, it's the Black, it's the Indigenous people who are most affected by the extremes of it. We are demanding to be at the table to be part of those solutions. And outdoor recreation is often the first step that's leading to those discussions. There is no planet B. That's what keeps me motivated. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. So I'll hand it back over to Galila. Thank you so much, uh, Jacqueline. That was beautiful. It's interesting how you know all of your comments really makes me reflect on my own experiences, not only at the island, but just experiencing um, the outdoor space, whether that be camping every summer or you know in the Don Valley. So thank you for that. Um, next up, we have uh, Jen Robertson. Uh, so Jen, uh, if you are there, the floor is now yours. Great, thank you. I, I believe I have some slides as well. I don't know if we're having a tech problem. Oh, here we go, perfect. Awesome, thank you. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, my name is Jen Robertson. Uh, I'm an urban planner, and I was invited today to speak to my work on planning for LGBTQ2 plus communities. I am part of the queer community. I'm a lesbian, I'm queer. Um, I use they, them, and she, her pronouns interchangeably in case anyone has to refer to me in the third person. I am a settler. Uh, my dad was born in Hamilton, Ontario. His family background goes back to Scotland. My mom was born in Bukadir in Shles, Algeria. She is Amazir, um, also known as Bear Bear, uh, the indigenous peoples of North Africa. Uh, and she moved to Toronto in the late 1980s. I was born in Etobicoke pre-amalgamation, uh, and I currently live in New York on Lenape land. Uh, I have six plus years of working on urban planning for queer people. Um, I've conducted master's research on LGBTQ2 plus public safety in Toronto, building on interviews, focus groups, and survey responses from community on their perspective of safety, hate crimes, and urban design. Um, at the time, I had the opportunity to partner with the nonprofit METRAC, uh, which is a great organization. They work to end gender-based violence across communities and definitely recommend looking them up if you haven't heard of them. Uh, they also offer lots of programs, including community-led safety audits. Um, I've also written a few articles for Spacing Magazine on queer planning and public sex and parks. Uh, so that's the context on me today. I'm sharing my perspective based on this past research I mentioned. Uh, I did a round robin of conversations with community um, ahead of the forum today and sharing my own experience. So thoughts are, are my own today. Uh, next slide, please. So, so by matter of background, LGBTQ2 plus Torontonians have a long-standing connection to Toronto Island and specifically Hamlin's Point as a queer space. So let's unpack that for a second, a lot going on at that sentence. So just to spell out, LGBTQ2 plus stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and two-spirit. The plus sign, there are many identities encapsulated there. I'll be using queer community as an umbrella term as well today. Um, and just to say, as a matter of fact, being a lesbian or being trans, being queer, being all of the above, uh, different people experience their sexuality and gender differently. Um, it gets even more complicated as we layer on race, income, and ability. Uh, I would say that there's a tendency for the overrepresentation of those who hold the most power, even within our marginalized community, an overrepresentation of white gay men as figureheads. Um, I would say that this is an issue at Hamlet's point as well in terms of how we use space, even within community community is far from a, a monolith. Um, also in terms of urban planning, urban planning historically hasn't really thought of planning for queer communities outside of designated queer areas, outside of a church in Wellesley, for example. Uh, I would say Hamlin's point on Toronto Island is unique in the city as a place where nature and queer community really come together. Um, so all of that is to say when I say Hamlin's is a queer space, it's also complicated. It was the home of Toronto's first pride. Um, if you check out that image on the right hand side, that is a a uh, poster I pulled from Toronto's first gay picnic in 1971. It is a free public space. Um, once you hop on that ferry, you can get uh, in and around the island. Um, it is an area where people are also known for cruising. It is an area that's known for public sex and the cruising bushes. It is also an area where people enjoy being in nature, uh, sort of vacation from the city. So sharing thoughts today on Toronto Island's natural space, design affirming Hamlin's as a queer space, um, rethinking the ferry landing, and continued investment in queer community uh, is the sliver that I'm offering to you all today. Next slide, please. 
So I, what I heard a lot ahead of the forum today is a lot of, um, of need for maintaining the natural space of Toronto Island. Um, I listened to the Indigenous Placekeepers video uh, and, and forum ahead of, um, ahead of the forum today, um, Ema's video as well, um, thinking of really wanting to prioritize non-European and non-invasive species by leaning on our uh, Indigenous Placekeepers uh, in terms of what that would look like within queer community, I uh, have to say, we have to prioritize our two-spirit and queer Indigenous community members. I'm going to say a lot of things today, I guess, is where, where I'm going. And if there's one thing that's taken away is that we really can't have a space for queer people on Toronto Island without um, Indigenous stewardship, without putting our, our Indigenous community members first, um, is the, the point to underline here. Thinking of natural space, really want to see communicating with community on the scope and intent and timeline of natural remediation projects. Um, there's been a lot of fencing off of areas on Toronto Island, um, fencing off of the cruising area um, without really any communicating or, or signage at the beach, um, how long that's gonna be or what that looks like. Uh, I would expect there to be a kind of knee jerk reaction from gays and queers who have fought long and hard for space, only to have it fenced off without a lot of uh, communication on what's happening with, with that space or how long we can expect things to be blocked off. Next slide, please. Hamlin's as a queer space. So the approach to Hamlin's point and coming off the ferry landing, the tiki taxi docks, as well as approaching the beach would benefit from queer symbols. Um, Pride flags definitely come to mind as a pretty straightforward one that we could uh, see on Toronto Island. The, the importance of queer symbols, it's really for visitors on the island to know that they are entering a queer space. So what I mean by visitors, um, we're looking for people who are maybe within community, who are looking to be among other queer people, say people from out of town, um, queers who uh, maybe are just finding community for the first time. But it's also beneficial for straight people um, to know that they are entering uh, a queer space. Uh, I would say a lot of us who have been going to Hamlin's Point for a long time know that it's a space for us. We know it's a queer space. We have figured that out. Um, but it is helpful for others to know why, why this space is important to, to our community. We already know it's queer. Um, on the right-hand side, you see a very American-style uh, ferry landing of a huge, uh, very American patriotic flag on the right, but the, just to draw your eye to the pride flag there, this is uh, uh, Cherry Grove on Fire Island in, in New York, nearby my, my current home. And when you land at, at Cherry Grove, the first thing you see is a giant pride flag. You get off the boat, you walk down the, the kind of alleyway there um, towards the, the main uh, area of, of Cherry Grove. And, it's really obvious right away there's a drag show happening on the left-hand side. Typically there's uh, music playing, there are kind of rainbow symbols everywhere. It's really obvious to anyone who's going there that they're entering a queer space. And I think that's, that's really important from a, a design and, and symbols perspective. Next slide, please. So thinking of, of the ferry landing. So in a lot of conversations I had ahead of the, of the uh, forum today, the ferry landing came up a lot. There's kind of this dead space between Hamlin's Point and the ferry landing, this underused grassy area. It's really hot in that area. Um, thinking of just simple things like adding picnic tables, more bike parking, space for dancing in the shade, more shade, most definitely. Um, opportunities to rethink this uh, the pathways leading between the ferry docks and, and the beach. There's this area called Beach Road, this paved path extending um, kind of from the ferry landing to uh, to the beach, there's another road that's parallel to it. Um, a main issue that's coming up right now, I would say at, at Hamlin's, is that the cruising bushes are thinning out. Um, this is a kind of an issue for, for two reasons. Um, the vast majority of people who are engaging in cruising in the bushes are seeking seclusion. Uh, many people are looking for an area where they can be uh, very, relatively secluded and not uh, encountering other people who are not also cruising. Uh, there's also many people visiting Hamlin's, um, much like the way that I, I personally use Hamlin's that are just spending time on the beach, not going to the bushes, trying to get to and from the ferry to the beach. I think it would benefit everyone to rethink adding more shrubbery, adding uh, kind of more uh, areas and, and rethinking that really open grassy space that um, nobody really seems to use as far as I can tell. I would also say that the space really feels frenetic and at times unsafe between the ferry landing and the beach. End of the night, people are leaving the beach area. Maybe they are a bit sun, sun wary. Maybe they um, have been um, consuming substances throughout the day. 
uh, is definitely an area around the end of the night that can be a very, very frenetic, and particularly for Black, Indigenous, and people of color community members who are much more susceptible to um, attacks. Um, over the past summer, there was a homophobic attack against a member of community named David Gomez. It was very well documented in the media if you want to look it up. Um, I can't speak to this incident firsthand besides being horrified and saying that this incident is unacceptable. And to say, I don't think that adding pride flags or redesigning the ferry landing will end homophobia or end transphobia, but there are definitely things that the city can do to invest in queer community. That takes me to my next slide, please. So supporting community organizations that do outreach at Hamlin's, definitely um, city support for Casey's House or AIDS Community of Toronto, definitely um, both on, on the island and, and off island offer a lot of great safe sex and harm reduction supplies. Uh, things that we definitely love that the city does, keeping those trash cans empty, responding to medical emergencies, um, the accessibility of the park overall is greatly appreciated uh, for our community members with disabilities, although we'll say that the actual beach itself is not accessible. And there are things that could be done there um, from a design perspective as well. Um, in terms of emergency response, medical emergencies, um, definitely a lot of support for EMS, uh, people getting too much sun or having medical issues. Uh, overall, have not heard a, a strong desire for more enforcement presence um, on Toronto Island, um, given the history of criminalizing queer people using parks, thinking of Project Marie back in 2016 in particular. I hope this doesn't come as a surprise. Um, we would definitely like a hands-off approach to keep Hamlin's queer. Rethinking of, of yachts, I was thinking of, of belonging ahead of the forum today, and I know that there's a, a yacht club on Toronto Island, maybe, maybe more than one. I just really seem that the people who um, belong on yachts, belong in a yacht club, are a really so, small subset of Toronto. Um, so beyond environmental, de environmental de degradation from boats, these large diesel powered boats, um, but above and beyond that, as a queer person on Hamlin's for, for decades, there have been straight people on boats that stare at us. Um, from the water while we're on the beach, um, definitely does not foster a sense of belonging. Also rethinking queer space beyond Hamlin's. Um, many of us went to Centerville as, as queer kids. I know I did uh, one day when I'm a queer parent, I hope to bring my kids there. Uh, so queer symbols like pride flags can really go beyond Hamlin's. I talked a ton about Hamlin's today because it's really important to our community, but rethinking gendered bathrooms or rethinking uh, kind of queerness across the island, uh, making concessions more affordable uh, where people tend to, to earn less than um, straight people writ large and, and broad strokes. So definitely that would be, I think, appreciated as well. And uh, definitely going uh, beyond this engagement, it's great that the forum's taking place today, but um, again, this is a sliver of community and definitely wanna see ongoing engagement going forward and I'm hopeful that that will take place. Uh, next slide, please. Hi, thank you. Uh, Miigwech, Marcy, um, I'll hand it back to Galila. Thank you so much, Jen, that was wonderful. Um, yeah, it's it's important to think about how we can extend this thinking, not only uh, just in, in specific spaces, but all across the island, so thank you. Um, next up, we have our final speaker of the evening, uh, Kofi, I, I think your camera is on, so whenever you are ready. Thank you, good evening, everyone. And uh, very happy to join you tonight and talk about this theme of belonging and specifically around Toronto Island and share a few of my perspectives, visions for how we make this precious space in our city a place that even a wider group of folks feel that they belong and feel connected to. And so, you know, I want to talk really, I don't have a formal presentation with slides, but I really want to talk from my own memories and experiences as a tool to kind of draw some insights around the potential I see on the island to really um, expand the way it welcomes folks and engages with them. And so I'll start with the story about my first time coming to Toronto Island. And it's possible that as a young child, I went to Centerville or something like that. It could have happened. Um, but what I'm first consciously aware of was going there like many folks uh, with a similar background to myself around Carabana. You know, I spent high school years in the western edge of Mississauga, you know, literally a couple blocks from where the GTA sprawl ended and, you know, the fields began. And at the time, as a 16-year-old, 15-year-old, you felt like it was the center of the universe. But then we all started to realize there was so much more out there. And 
whether it was taking the go train down or a bunch of us as young men piling like a clown car into a tercel and driving down to the city you know this was part of how we began to explore the world and the larger region and Carabano was what we really lived for as young people. You know, in the late 90s, you'd go down, hang out on Young Street, all of those pieces. Um, it was part of our exposure to the wider world. And like many folks mentioned before, it was around Carabana Sunday, where they used to always have a fete on the island. That was my first introduction. And I can remember that day. I think I would have been 17, was with two of my friends. We had never been to the island before. We kind of found our way to the ferry terminal. Somehow we got there. I think we showed up at a time where we couldn't even get entrance to the party, but we just kind of walked around, you know, we hung out, we chatted up other teenagers, we saw this amazing view of the skyline, and I just remember feeling like this was this jewel, this gem, this special place, but also we had no idea what else was there, where there was to go, we probably went, you know, a kilometer from the dock and back, and, and, and that was about it for the next couple of years. You know, everyone talked about the island. We knew there was this nude beach somewhere, but it was this kind of this mysterious place that you only felt that you went to once a year. And even uh, at 19, I moved downtown and living in the city and my wife who'd grown up her whole life in Toronto, similar for her, she knew the island is a place you went to Centerville as a kid. And then you went every year for Carabana or you went on a boat cruise and you kind of went around this kind of dark island at night and saw it and you, you knew people lived there but you didn't really know much about what was there the amenities what was available and and even for people again who I knew who had a deep experience in the city I remember my 20s arguing with a friend who was convinced there was a bridge that connected Toronto Island to the mainland and you know he was someone his whole life in Toronto and he was sure and you know I was just one of those dudes back then who would put a map of Toronto up in my dorm room on the wall and I knew there wasn't a bridge but it just showed this just lack of knowledge and I share these stories because today I love the island we go about twice a month during the summer my family and during the pandemic you know even more sometimes we're going once a week and I've explored it in depth and we've enjoyed the beaches but here is the thing it wasn't till I moved back to Toronto after having lived in Europe and lived in South Africa and traveled the world, you know, in, in my early 30s, coming back with that same adventurous mentality you get from traveling and deciding, hey, I really want to explore this place I live. I really want to see every pocket and nook and cranny of the city that I got to know the island. You know, I literally came back and did exactly what I did in foreign cities. I went, I got a lonely planet, Toronto. And like a tourist, I read through and found out about places and went out of my way to explore. And that, my friends, is a problem. Now, you know, maybe I'm weird or unusual. Maybe many people on this call here have had a lifetime of experiences exploring the island, and, and my experience seems really out of the known. But I know from many folks I've worked with, with young people I've worked with, specifically working class folks, racialized young people who live in the inner suburbs, there is a massive gap between the wilderness areas and natural attractions in this city and marginalized communities. And we do a really poor job as a city at closing that gap. And last summer, my business partner, Zara Ibrahim, and I, we launched an entire campaign called All Out Canada, which was just around this theme of getting more racialized folks into wilderness spaces and, you know, building on that amazing work that Jacqueline Scott and others have done in the space. And, and the themes and the learning from that campaign connect directly to this conversation. And so to start, I'd say, if you want to create a sense of belonging for communities, a prerequisite is that people need to know about the spaces. They need to understand how to get to the spaces and move around the spaces and maximize their enjoyment and the experience there. Because without that, you know, people won't go, they can't go or they'll have a very limited experience and you can't even talk about belonging. And so, you know, let, let's go into detail around some of these pieces. Why is it that People like myself who were living in Toronto for years never had any full understanding of what was on the island. Why is it so many young people that I know maybe have gone once in their life but don't see it as a regular place for them? Well, part of it is that we do a pretty poor job in the city of raising awareness of folks 
about these kind of local amenities we have. And to be honest, I think a lot of the root of it is the lack of a use of an equity lens when we think about our policy around parks and other natural areas. You know, historically, the folks who've managed our essential public assets, who create our policies, who create the programs, they tend to be educated folks, predominantly white and overwhelmingly middle class people. Those are the kind of people who in this city have grown up with that insider knowledge about these natural spaces, whose parents took them to the island growing up, who've had experiences hiking in ravines, who've taken a kayak out on the Humber River before, whose families you know, now go on Sundays to the brickworks for the farmer's market. And when that's your lived experience, it's easy to assume that other folks have that same experience. And I find, again, this is more than even race. I find this really has to do with class bias, right? It's a blind spot to the fact that one of the major benefits in our society of a middle-class upbringing is systems navigation. You learn how the system works, how to find the information you need, how to advocate for yourself if you're not getting it, and you grow up with a feeling of belonging and entitlement and ownership to the city that many folks coming from other backgrounds don't have, right? I think about the years working in Jane and Finch and a young man I was mentoring one time and he looked at me and said, you know, Kofi, traveling downtown, when I go downtown, it's like going to another planet. He didn't say another city, didn't say another nation, but he said going downtown is like he got in a rocket ship and went to Mars. Think about other youth workers I've worked with who would talk about bringing kids from Malvern downtown for events and seeing, you know, 12-year-olds taking out their phones or taking pictures of the CN Tower. And I said, what are you doing? And they're saying, this is the closest I've ever been to it in my life. Kids born and raised in Toronto. But if this isn't your lived experience, you may not get it. You might think, oh, but everyone knows about Toronto Island. It's our most popular attraction. Who hasn't gone there? And when that's your assumption, then you move forward thinking that you don't need to advertise it within the city that you don't need to have clear signage that tells people where to go, that you don't need to have detailed guides that are available that breaks down what the islands has to offer or how to get there, right? And that's one of the simplest pieces. I remember multiple times when I would try to go for caravan or other pieces as a young man at the ferry terminal, you know, when you're waiting in line, trying to ask people questions like, so, so how do these tickets work? Am I gonna be able to get a ferry back at night? What's the difference between Hanlands Point and getting off at Center Island? And my experience typically was getting rude answers from folks, was getting rushed through, was being disrespected, people being like, why are you wasting time if you don't know what you're doing here? And so that's a first piece to belonging. We need to stop assuming everyone knows about the islands and what they have to offer and work from the assumption that there are significant portions of our population in this city who have a very low awareness about what's happening in the islands and we need to directly market and communicate to these folks what is available there. And when you arrive at that ferry terminal, you need proper customer service. Now, I admit, my experience has gotten a bit better over the years. Maybe that's because I'm showing up with more knowledge. But whether it's ambassadors who are standing out by the lines to help people who are there for their first time navigate a trip to the island or display boards at the front or videos that are playing kind of key highlights and key information for the island, you know, there's so much more we could do right at the start to help people understand how to maximize their time on the island, right? We need to stop saying, well, you know, people can just go online before they come. They can figure out what they need to know. And we need to get more proactive. Having insider knowledge should not be required to enjoy the islands. And so I'll give another reflection I've had over the last year and a half, because as I said, we were extensively at the island this summer. And one of the things I can say, you know, from going there and, you know, using that participant observation I got trained to do in, in my graduate studies is I just watch the people and how they move through the space. And the one thing I can say, when you go from, you know, kind of on Center Island from the ferry all the way up to the pier, that is a space these days that is full of racialized folks, that's full of newcomer families. It was actually packed this summer to the point it was uncomfortable, but it was full of people from diverse backgrounds, eating, playing, some folks on the beach, lots of folks at Centerville, and that was great. And I think if we think about this continuum of engagement, 
you know, that's the next step up. You've got the folks who don't know about the islands at all and rarely go. And then the next level is the folks who just know about Center Island. And there's lots of people like that, and that's great, it's increasing. But when you start heading over towards Island, towards beach, which is my personal favorite beach on the island, suddenly the crowd changes. You get far less newcomers. You get far less people in general, far less racialized folks. And the same thing around Hanlands and the open spaces on the other side of the island where there's great beaches, great park spaces. But again, you don't see many folks who are there at Center, Center Island venturing out to those parts. And so when you reflect on this and think about the difference of who uses different parts of the island and who enjoys other beaches and spaces, you need to realize that many folks go there and need support to experience the full range of things to do. And we talked about knowledge gaps and having good maps and clear maps, that's helpful. But there's a couple other things to think about. You know, one is transportation. Obviously paying for the ferry is a barrier for some, and there need to be thoughts about that to just make it more accessible for folks to get there who finances our barrier. But also the reality is the islands are big. You know, I've done that walk from Hanlon's Ferry over to Center Island before. It's a long walk. I'm sure there's people here who've done that. It, it takes a while. And to me, there is no reason why you can't have some form of zero emission public transportation on the island. Even if it's like the kids train at High Park or Little Shovel, or Little Shuttle, rather. I'm not saying you have a big bus or light rail or streetcars. But right now, the people who move around the island, including myself, are the folks who bring bikes. You know, we were lucky to be in a position where when COVID hit, our family invested in really nice bikes. I got a bike seat for my daughter. And that was what opened up the islands for us. That's what turned us into island insiders, being able to show up at the docks with our bike and then cruise around for the day, explore, find different places. And that's not an option for a lot of folks. But of course, we know what an option is, and that's renting bikes. And you can do that on the island. But to the life of me, I don't understand why you have to walk all the way from the ferry to the pier to rent bikes, and that bikes aren't available all months of the year. I remember one time my boy Hashi came from the UK, and it was in the fall. I said, let's go to the island. I think we can rent a bike. We'll just spend the day and get there and walk the way and find it's closed. And so mobility options and expanding them is something we really need to think about. Because one thing we learned from the All Out campaign that I'm sure many of you know, critical to enjoying natural spaces is all about gear. The better gear and more appropriate gear you have, the better experience and the more likely you are to return. So I think with the islands, we need a principle that everything you need to enjoy the islands should be accessible when you arrive, right? Those carts that people use to pull their picnic supplies and sometimes little kids, why aren't they available to rent when you show up? Why can't you get the chariots to attach to your bike so you can pull your toddler? Whether it's swimming gear or beach blankets, sunblock, water, whatever it is, trying to make that as available to people right away so people don't have to search for it, so you don't have to come with it from home, allows people to have a more immersive experience. You know, if I can go to Algonquin Park and fairly easily get my whole family kitted up to spend the day biking across trails in Algonquin. Why is it easier to do it there than it is at Toronto Island? You know, why? Watercraft, that's another huge one. You know, personally, I love canoeing. And with the all out campaign, with all the racialized millennials we engaged with, so many of them said, hey, that's one thing we've never done that we wanna try doing, canoeing, right? And who doesn't love the idea of getting out on the water? And the little channels that run through the island, they're perfect for it. And I know, again, there are rental options, yes, but they're not easy and they're not well publicized. You know, I have had the chance to canoe on Toronto Island and it was through one of those companies on the harbor front. You have to book in advance and they water taxi you over and the canoe's there. And, and it was amazing. I had a great afternoon with a friend, but it's not a well-known option. And when I talked to friends who are, you know, pretty aware, they still believe the only way you can take a canoe or kayak to the islands is to rent it at the harbor front and have to cross that inner harbor. And so when I talk about it, they say, Kofi, you're crazy. I'm not trying to get capsized and lost at sea going over to the islands. And I have to explain multiple times, no, but it is possible to rent a canoe there. You can do it. And when people hear about that, they get excited. But again, when you go to the island, these rentals aren't super obvious. 
they're not so accessible. And many times it's the folks who actually own the equipment who seem to be the ones primarily enjoying that feature of the islands. More generally, you know, when I think about natural environments and the natural features of the place that are, is in this place that we live, you know, when we talk about belonging, really it's about creating meaningful associations that connect you to the geography, that allow you to feel rooted on a deeper and dare I say spiritual level to the city, to the place, to the country. And despite the fact that Toronto's name, the, the root of the name of the city references our many rivers, despite the fact that we're a lakeside city, that the lake is our major defining geographic feature, many folks in the city have limited engagement with the lakes or rivers. And it's a shame. And I'd love to see the city more aggressively try to encourage folks to get on the water and experience this part of the city. Because when you experience it, you feel more grounded and connected to the city. And that builds civic engagement and ownerships. And we've seen more people trying to do it and get out with COVID, but let's double down on that. And of course, and people have talked about this earlier, but one of the other ways that you make natural spaces less intimidating and people more open to explore is when you show up and see your own culture there. You know, I explained that Caravana brought me and many of the people I know to the island for the first time. This is so core to belonging, that you see your cultural activities and festivities in the space. So that's critical to the strategy too, you know, understanding how folks want to use the island and building infrastructure and programming, and most importantly, a system that allows you to book spaces that's accessible and culturally relevant. But an example about infrastructure, I'll give you a funny story. You know, I've been, as I mentioned, over the last couple of years, we've been really poking around the island. And I've noticed these strange devices, right? They're like a metal pole and they've got a metal circle at the top and then they have all these chains hanging down. And for the longest time I was looking at these things, I'd say to Lisa, my wife, what are these things? Are they for barbecuing? Do you hang stuff from them? And then one day told me, he said, no, 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 that's for Frisbee golf. And I was like, what the heck? Now I'm not dissing Frisbee golf. I'm sure it's cool sport. I'm sure many people enjoy it, but I've never actually seen anyone playing it on the island. But you know, that course is all over the place. And when I looked at those Frisbee golf installations, whatever you call the actual devices, I had to wonder when they were installed, was there a cultural lens used? Did people do an audit of the physical infrastructure on the island and say, what cultural amenities do diverse populations in our city use? And are they present here or not? You know, one of my students at U of T, he did his whole master's paper looking at why Toronto parks have all of these bocce ball courses and, and pizza ovens, but far less basketball courts or other an amenities like cricket pitches or tander ovens that would be more relevant to the populations today in the city. And of course, that comes from the fact that parks were built and infrastructure was selected based on the ethnic groups who were in the city at the time of origin. But as times go on, demographics change. And so how does the island become a place where, you know, not only do you have events that are there that meet your cultural needs, but also infrastructure that is culturally relevant and isn't biased towards people who are already outdoor recreation enthusiasts and have all that cool gear hanging up in their garage. Finally, I wanna talk about that artscape center on the island. Now that is such a cool space. And I was there a couple of years ago to speak to a group that was doing some, uh, like a learning retreat. And I remember going to this space, I think it was an old school, I believe, that's been turned into this space that people can rent and, and, and do events. And, and I remember being there and thinking, wow, the island has so much potential as being a space for communities to access outdoor recreation for the first time, to learn in an experiential way about this natural environment. And it's much closer than driving to Muskoka or the Kawarthas or anywhere like that. You know, when, when I was running the Sea Center for Young Black Professionals, we would ground all of our programs with young people. They were black youth. Many had been in conflict with the law or in precarious housing or had lived experiences of poverty. And we would start these eight month cohorts that we do with them with overnight retreats in the wilderness. That was like our secret sauce 
Those retreats were essential to forming the caring communities that carried those cohorts forward and started people on a journey of personal transformation. And so I've got the proof, I've got the receipts on how experiential education in nature can be powerful for young people in this city who haven't had that exposure before. But as I said, we would have to drive an hour and a half, two hours outside of the city to do that work. Well, why not the island? How can we really maximize the island as a space for experiential learning, for nature education, for people to learn how to camp, to learn how to get into a boat, to have retreats, to really build in robust experiences for young people, especially those in the inner suburbs, so that they can see what's there and then they can be the ones to encourage their parents to go. So that they can be the ones, you know, 20 years from now who can say, yeah, I spent three weeks learning on the island when I was 16, and now it's a place I'm bringing my own kids to because I feel this deep connection here. So, you know, recently, and many people probably saw it, because I, I know folks are here who are passionate about the islands, this uh, report that one of the yacht clubs you know, has a vision to redevelop their space. And they're talking about potentially adding workplaces and retail to the island. And, you know, that's interesting, but it's, it's not part of my vision. But I'm not a Luddite, I'm not against progress. I actually think that there's a lot of infrastructure and development we could add to the island. But for me, what makes me excited is the idea of more recreation spaces, more, as I mentioned, rental locations, new performance venues, places for outdoor cooking, places to learn about nature, places you could even stay overnight, to camp, more ways to move around. I'm all for that. We definitely do not need a mall on the island, but it certainly could use some significant investment. But investments that I described are all part of this larger mission of cracking open this space to a much wider group of people beyond just insiders, which now includes me, I'm including myself, but it needs to go beyond those who have figured out the code for getting the most around the island. No public space in this city of this level of beauty and grandeur should require any code breaking to be accessed. It should be easy. Now, certainly there is a feeling of belonging that comes from being an insider in a space. We see this all the time in nature, but to be frank, that's an exclusive and elitist sense of belonging. And that's not what we need. We need to focus on our islands, on creating belonging for as wide a swath of people as possible. And from the moment people arrive looking for the ferry or the water taxi to the very end of the day, they should feel that this is a space that's open, welcoming to them and trying to facilitate their journey, not making them have to hunt for it. And we need to understand belonging is a mental association we create when we link a physical place to our own story of self. And the way we do that is simple. We focus first and foremost on the human experience the user experience on the island. If it's accessible, if it's open, if people feel safe, then they will have a good time. And that belonging, that sense of rootedness in the place will naturally evolve. That's been my experience on the island. I think it's probably the experience of many folks on this call. But I challenge us, let's make it our mission now to extend that experience to as many of our fellow citizens as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kobe. That was awesome. I really appreciated your, your, you know, the way you described, you know, this should be a facilitating of, of a journey for folks and not, not uh, a challenge. It shouldn't be a challenge. Thank you. So with that said, I'd like to welcome all of our speakers back. Um, I think everyone is back. Yeah, lovely. Okay. Um, and I really appreciate again, everyone for your presentations and your insights. Um, and I think all of you, you know, gave excellent entry points into this discussion about um, unpacking this conversation around belonging in our parks and our public spaces. Um, and I think it fits really nicely and, and helps us and situates us nicely um, to dig a little bit deeper and to really understand how these ideas kind of overlap with one another and really how, um, in fact, fostering a sense of belonging really relies on making sure that we see one another and we're having these dialogues. Um, so with that said, before we jump into our Q&A uh, portion, um, I just want to send out a quick reminder to everyone who is in attendance uh, that you can submit your questions using the Q&A box or, or raise your hand. Um, if you do raise your hand, uh, I will identify you and you can hit star nine on your phone if you're calling in uh, or you can unmute yourself 
um, and, and ask your question. Uh, but just to get us rolling, um, I'm going to pop out a question for all of our panelists and maybe each can respond with maybe one or two sentences. Um, and my first question really is quite broad. It's uh, how do you define or understand uh, the meaning of belonging in, in public spaces? And maybe I can uh, pass it off to Jen um, to, to start us off. That's nice. So in terms of, of belonging, I, I think for me, belonging is seeing people uh, and seeing yourself reflected back to you in space. So being somewhere and, and feeling like people who look like you are in and around the, the space that, that you're in and feeling like feeling a sense of, of safety as well. Um, I would say those are the two things that come to mind kind of high, high level. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I think that really connects nicely with what Jacqueline was speaking about earlier. So Jacqueline, did you have any uh, reflections that you'd like to share on that? Yeah, for me, belonging is when I show up, the staff look like me. It means that when I'm with a group of my friends that I don't have to be concerned with, oh my God, is somebody going to call the police? Because a whole group of Black people are hanging out on the island. So that's what belonging means. I can relax with my friends without fear of being over-policed, over-surveilled. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, amazing. And it makes me at least think about, you know, sometimes and the way I connect to this conversation is really, and I had expressed this to the panelists uh, when we first met, um, a lot of the time when I explore, I engage in public space, sometimes it is on my own. And so, uh, of course, we can engage as, as a group, as a collective, but also understanding that we should feel you know, that we belong in public space, even when we are on our own. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Yuma, would you uh, like to offer some thoughts? Sure. Um, the belonging piece, I think, uh, for me, uh, the belonging piece, I think lands really, really close to the identity piece. Uh, I have a lot of experience working with Indigenous youth. Um, and I feel like the ability to belong somewhere and have that strength in, in like your identity um, I think means a safe space where, where you feel, you know, like you're, you, there are no barriers, there's, you know, there's no hostility, you know, like kind of to what some of uh, cohorts are basically saying to be exactly who you are and um, it's a safe space for that. Yeah, amazing, thank you. And, and finally, Kofi, would you like to, to add anything as well? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, I think belonging is when you feel a space is part of your story, is part of your identity. Um, but I think belonging to me also connects to, to feeling welcomed. And that's where some of these pieces, um, I think we've all been speaking about, uh, that yes, it's very possible, as I said, to be super diligent and do your research and find out about where things are and look into it. But like anything in life, you feel welcomed when someone invites you in. When someone doesn't bring you to the party and say, oh, figure out where the food is and you can find the washroom on your own and figure out where to put down your coat. Like, sure, we're all adults. We could navigate. But that's not a space you feel you belong. Like when someone welcomes you at the door and says, good to see you. Let me show you, you know, where you can put your coat. The washrooms are upstairs. There's a spread out here. What, what do you need? And I think there are ways we do that without having a physical person, but in how we build spaces and in the design that can make people feel that same degree of welcomingness. And I think that's a core piece to belong. Yeah. Um, yeah, I totally, completely agree. Um, so just following up on, on some of your thoughts, I think a key dimension of, of this effort towards moving towards belonging is really about uh, reflecting, and many of you referenced this uh, in, your, in, your, in your pieces uh, that you spoke to earlier, uh, reflecting on place-based histories and understanding uh, the impact and the meanings that it has in our, on our present and, and in our future. Um, so with that being said, um, there's a question in the chat that I think um, it is a great one to bring up now and and it asks it's from Kelsey Taylor and and they ask uh, what are opportunities for embedding indigenous stewardship uh, rights and decision making uh, at the Toronto island um, and of course anyone who uh, you know feels that they can answer the question but um, you would you like to, to take that uh, question um yeah sure i don't mind i think i'm gonna do something a bit coy though i i will open it up to um the other panelists and go back to 
you've all seen the video and you've all sort of reflected on that. And I think um, what are some of those things that you took from the video that like um, Darren and Margaret specifically were, were asking? I think for me, um, you know, going beyond land acknowledgement is something that, that really uh, stood out to me in particular. I was actually looking at the thinking of um, the Venn diagram of, of queer community and indigenous communities, thinking of our, our queer indigenous and, and two-spirit community members. I noticed that the city of Toronto has an advisory board for, for queer people and they actually flipped, uh, typically the acronym is LGBTQ2S and they flipped it and made it 2S LGBTQ basically. And uh, part of me, I saw that this before the forum, like, is that actually, I'm hoping that's intentional and I'm hoping that that's just one step towards when we're talking about queer people or planning for queer people, planning for um, Indigenous communities that we're putting our, our Indigenous community members first. When I think on the practical level, it's about putting up much more heritage plaques, which talks about the Indigenous history and the Indigenous presence of the area. It's about when you have trails, make the trail names mean something. Um, it's about the opportunity for showcasing Indigenous art, but don't do it as adds on. It's actually embedding that in the design. So that for me is how you acknowledge that continuous Indigenous presence and the importance of it there. And the clocks do mean something. And I think I'll just add from the video, people were talking about, you know, have that physical presence on the water. And so I think you know, we want to celebrate the history and make people aware of that, but also, you know, what does it mean to actually give folks space, you know, whether it's an Indigenous operated uh, center or, or a part of the island where we could see um, folks and, and specifically the Mississaugas of the New Credit, actually having a part of the island that's run and, and managed by Indigenous people. I think that's a beautiful vision as well and a way that could really honor that history of, of who was there uh, first and who still, you know, has stewardship of this land. And so, you know, it'd be really interesting to meet Indigenous folks and, and other groups um, that are culturally defined, but specifically in, in Indigenous folks having space on the island and having facilities that, that are managed and governed um, by Indigenous people would be, I think, a great part of this. And if I can just quickly add is that there are many formal gardens on the island but how about reducing the ecological colonialism by having more native plants? Something as simple as that to say, hey, this is what spring looks like on the island. These are the native plants. Put some plaques up to explain what they are um, because we don't see that on the island. Yeah. Also Absolutely. seems like um, governance and, and decision-making too is making sure that, um, you know, first and foremost, whoever's deciding what happens to the island and, and where money's put in particular, I know the, the plan doesn't have uh, finances associated with it, but as infrastructure is being built out, uh, Indigenous governance should be, should be first. Yeah, and I think um, the other point that was really, really clear to me was, was the direct ask, you know, um, whether it's through advocacy, whether it's through placeholding, but like, you know, I think it's a big desire for the Mississauga to have some land, basically, that has access to the waterfront. Uh, and I think that that was sort of the this, the arcing piece for, for Darren specifically. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I do see a hand up uh, that has been up for quite some time, and I think uh, it makes sense to, to ask Danny S. Uh, if you are still there, um, to, I would like to ask you to, to present a question to the, um, to the panelists, um, so you can unmute yourself. Um, okay. Oh. Okay, I don't think uh, Danny is currently there, but that's okay. Um, I, that is all to say Danny has been uh, putting up lots of supportive messages in, in the chat um, or in the Q&A section. Um, so be sure that their support is, is certainly um, uh, acknowledged. Um, so I guess following up on this conversation around um, you know, the different types of designs or strategies that uh, could possibly be introduced into, uh, you know, the Toronto Island. I'd be curious if uh, the panel, so maybe we can start off with Jacqueline, because I know you do spend a lot of time um, thinking about these very uh, 
technical things. Um, I'd be interested to hear, you know, what are some initiatives or strategies or even designs that you think are great examples of belonging in parks um, and whether that be in Toronto or, or more broadly um, and how would you like want to see this concept of belonging be applied in, in our in our parks and public space, whether that be at the island or, or more broadly? Because I tend to be a history buff and I'm drawn to that. So for me, part of belonging is knowing the history of a place. And so from a black perspective, it is um, celebrating that Caribana on the island is was is still important to the black community and just something to say yeah this is how we make this place our own so that would be important to me to acknowledge that and also um, another thing i'd be looking at in terms of place making it's more from an ecological perspective it's the need for more trees to provide shade and there are some places on the island where it's open grasslands, um, not inviting to look at, um, and definitely not enough shade. And in the climate crisis, we need all the shade that we can get. Mm -hmm. So it's the acknowledgement of the Black history, the commemoration of that, and then much more trees and also adding some benches. Jen, did you have any commentary on, on this in particular? I know uh, some of your thinking and some of the work that you presented earlier also spoke to, uh, you know, what are the types of interventions that could possibly be introduced to more make these spaces a little bit more uh, welcoming? Yeah, one thing I can add, uh, you know, I think I, I went through some some designs uh, already, but one thing I can add, I think that a lot of the conflicts that come up on, on the island currently, uh, whether it be physical violence, whether it be people who are, are trying to enjoy nature, encountering people who are there for, for cruising, for example, it's not a ton of space that, that we have on the island, right? Like it feels like it is huge and, and going island, kind of one island side to the other, it's, it's not um, insignificant, but it just feels like so much of the space is just kind of like grassy, underutilized, really hot, no, no shade to Jacqueline's point, like it's not really that pleasant to be in. And it feels like the, the more that we have kind of natural space, the more we're bringing back the actual indigenous natural space of the island. I, I hope that there is just more space for everyone to enjoy as well that will um, kind of address some of these these conflicts that do currently come up. Um, you know, Helen's Point's eroding. That's that's an issue I, I think writ large. It's not the only beach that's eroding. To try and bring back the, the natural space um, definitely comes to mind. Thank you. Um, I do see another hand up uh, and hopefully we can get to, to this question. So uh, Jennifer Grossman, uh, hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. Um, if you'd like to in unmute yourself, um, you should be able to ask a question. Um, Hmm. Okay. It seems as though that is a challenge. So uh, we will come back to you, Jennifer. But in the meantime, uh, I'll ask another question. Um, and this might sh shift our focus. Oh. Did that work? Oh. Yes, yes. Yay. Very well done. Welcome. Um, thank you so much. First of all, I just want to say I am very grateful for this panel. Um, I, I was clapping a lot and it made me feel really um, heard and understood. Um, so I'm very grateful for it. Uh, my only comment that I would like to make tonight is that um, I think a lot of conflict um, in some of the conversations that I'm a part of and that I witness has a lot to do with a lack of understanding of the different ways in which people and different cultures celebrate space, public spaces, and what they value and how they utilize that space, whether it is a barbecue, um, gathering with friends to dance over music, um, to um, be within nature to do these types of activities that other people feel um, don't belong in those spaces. And I think that that's part of the education. I mean, my first time, I'm also from Mississauga, and my first time on the island was for Caravana. And, it, and um, I also go to the island to be on the beach and to explore by bike, but I also go there to dance. And I feel like there's a lot of um, 
opinions about using music as a form of therapy and a form of gathering and a form of celebration um, and a way to kind of find space um, and feel a sense of belonging, especially for the queer community. Um, and I just want to make sure that that is really understood by the city planners, that they, um, it, these spaces need to be safe. Um, they need to be regulated so that it is safe. Um, and if we don't have these safe spaces, people are going to find them and it's not going to be safe. And a lot of these spaces aren't affordable for everyone. So um, just making sure that we honor the different ways in which people use public spaces and that music and dance and performance still have a home there. And perhaps we should educate ourselves in the different, different ways in which we can celebrate the multiple different ways in which um, different cultures celebrate um, using dance and art and music. And that's all I have to say. And just thank you so much. I just hear these conversations a lot and it usually comes from some of the recreational users who don't understand um, how to share space for music. Um, and I just wanna make sure that that isn't lost. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I, I'd like to give the, the panelists an opportunity to respond or, or uh, reflect on anything um, if, if, uh, if it fits. Um, Just a quick comment on that was um, the report that my colleague and I, Ambika Tanati, did on race and nature in the city for Nature Canada. One of the things we actually explored was about the different cultural meanings around public space. And some of the recommendations included that for some communities, the idea of when you go to nature, it's for socializing. So you may show up in groups of 30 or 40 people from your community and you're going to barbecue and you need picnic benches. But if those picnic benches aren't available, it's affecting how you use the space. If the barbecue pits are not available, it's affecting how you use the space. And because those community groups are racialized, it now adds another dimension in terms of being feeling out of place. And for a Black perspective, music is, also, is very important to our culture. And the concern that, oh, if I put the music on again, is it going to trigger somebody calling the police? So part of my thinking around the island is to actually do cultural audits in terms of who are the different users of this space? What are the things that are important to those cultures? And there will be some overlaps and some conflicts, but at least being aware that there are different cultural needs, there are different cultural orientations to using space. That's a start. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I would just add quickly that, you know, we have this tradition in Canada that, you know, I, I was a Boy Scout and I'm very familiar with it, that when we're in the outdoors, we must be silent. And, and I understand it. And it makes sense in certain contexts, if you want to see birds, if you want to see wildlife. Um, but I also believe that part of being an inclusive, diverse society is as populations change, the way we relate to spaces, the way we move through the city changes and it evolves. And it's about a negotiation and finding room for other folks. So I couldn't agree more that, you know, if you're in the heart of Killarney or another provincial park, should you be bringing a massive speaker and blaring it? Maybe not, but the islands is a park. You know, it, it is part of an urban environment. And I think people, I, I, for me too, that's a lot of time when I go to the islands on the beach, I bring my speaker with my family, we're enjoying music. And so I think having an openness to that, but also understand there might be some folks who wanna have a more contemplative nature walk and there could be spaces for that too. But I think we've got to find ways um, that don't see this as a conflict, but say there's actually is enough room for everyone. There are different ways that people move through the city and the island should be a celebration of that difference versus a conflict. And, and the idea, you know, our kind of old Toronto, the good culture, that, that we bring with us at times, which, which can sometimes be like, you know, that there's something fundamentally wrong with people having a party, having a good time in public space. I think that's something we can move past and say, no, people experiencing joy in the islands is exactly the type of thing that gives people that sense of belonging we're talking about. And ways that people find joy without hurting anyone else should be celebrated and a core part of this new plan. Wonderful, yeah, thank you. Um, 
Now, moving on, I see that there are a couple of questions um, revolving around the master plan, plan specifically. And there's some questions around, you know, will the master plan integrate um, work around public bicycle pumps and, and different considerations. So um, I'd just like to emphasize that the city will be doing an extensive public engagement uh, process and presenting options for the master plan earlier next year, which is, is very soon. We are nearly at the end of December already. Um, and if you'd like to, to you know, access some more information prior to that, you can of course go to uh, the city's website, toronto.ca um, uh, toronto forward slash island master plan for more information. And you can also sign up uh, for more updates um, that way as well. So just wanna make sure that we acknowledge those questions as well. Um, we do have a couple of other uh, hands up, so I, I do want to, you know, jump on those really quickly. Um, I see Mark Dupont. Um, if you'd like to mute yourself, or if you have an option to mute, the floor is now yours. Hi, how are you doing? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, beautiful. Oh, well, I want to thank you very much for having this event. It's not at all what I was expecting. I was expecting something like a lot of people who are here were just talking about the master plan. But I appreciate the uh, the perspective that this brought to uh, to the use of the island. I've lived on the island for years, not anymore, but I used to. And I drive a water taxi going across the island. So I have direct contact and I have that ambassadorship to be able to introduce people to this new space to make sure to maximize their experience. I was especially jazzed to see that uh, Kofi got out there this summer and he really got to learn it and he got to appreciate the diversity of space that's out there. Uh, I'm gonna just address uh, just one, each of you individually. Yuma, I love the idea of the stewardship of the island and I would love to see more of a presence from the ind indigenous population. We bring a lot of new visitors and new arrivals to the island constantly. And I find that that original side of our culture, that original Canadian side of ourselves is not represented on the islands. Uh, I saw there was a gentleman who put a houseboat at Ontario Place to talk about the, 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 the First Nations history in this area. And I found that it was completely out of place. It needed to be on the island. It needed to be close to where the people are, not tucked away in the marina at Ontario Place. I thought that was the wrong place for it. Jacqueline, uh, the, 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 the diversity of the people who serve people on the island and, and, that, and that ability to see yourself in, in the island I agree with you is absolutely vital. And the people that I bring to the island are of all races, all backgrounds, all colors. And I think that to be able to see themselves on there is absolutely crucial. And I think that as time goes on and as more multicultural people discover that island, there's gonna be a growth in that because the people who work on the island are people who came to it first on a recreational level and then develop that passion and that love for it to get there. Uh, at the, for Jen, um, my work, I work for Tiki Taxi, so my involvement in traffic and moving people to Hanlon's Beach is pretty much a key role of mine. And the feeling of safe space and the feeling of using that space between the ferry and the beach as a usable space. And Kofi mentioned something about a cricket field. There's an old baseball field there that's completely unused. I think that having cricket tournaments on the island would be fantastic, especially using Hanlon's. And exposing people to the queer community by bringing multicultural people to it to show the safety and the wholesomeness of that community, I think would be a way of crossing over and of, of breeding understanding so that, that that queer side to Hanlon's also becomes part of the multicultural side. The final thing I wanna say is that all of these things to me tie together in a way that, you know, you talked about being able to rent bikes closer to the dock, being able to buy things like sunblock and things like that closer to the dock, that accessibility. Uh, right now, the, the concession monopoly on Center Island, I think, is a key side to that. I think that the color of the people who show up on the island does not, is not reflected in the food, in the entertainment, in the way that the thing is used. I love Subway as much as the next person, but I want a shawarma shop. I want to have, like, I want to have jerk chicken. I want to have a truck selling Mexican food on Center Island. I want to have, like, Every week, five trucks should get free ferry access to the island to represent the food culture of this country, of this city, and to celebrate what the city has become. As an old white guy, I know what the city was and what the city is now is so much better. And I think Center Island and the, and the island as a whole have to reflect that 
by bringing in all those cultures and giving independent young business people access to that island to celebrate those cultures and to celebrate all those beautiful things that we can all bring. So thank you again very much for all your perspectives. That was really good. Thank you so much, Mark. That was wonderful. I can feel your passion, you know, just, the, just you know, your experience uh, speaks volumes. So thank you for sharing. Um, with that said, we have uh, another question uh, in the Q&A that I'd like to get to, and, and this is for um, all of the panelists. Um, and the question is from Ben Wyatt. And this, uh, their question is, do you think that some of the current neighboring uses on the island, such as the airport uh, or housing, impact inclusivity or a sense of belonging? Um, so uh, maybe we can start off uh, with Kofi. Yeah, I mean, that is, that, that's a great question. Um, so the airport is an interesting one. I know very controversial and about expansions of the airport and, and its use and access. Um, in a way, you know, I think this has to do with like our whole waterfront, right? About to what extent should it also be a place of business and jobs and what place should it be recreation? So like when we have the red path sugar factory there on the harbor front and it's unloading things from ships right beside you know sugar beach where people are hanging out personally i'm okay with that mix i i think it's it's kind of interesting it's kind of quirky it's kind of toronto but ha having the island airport there to me has has never disturbed my experience there might be others who've experienced it, it differently i think adding jets would probably tip the scale where it would be highly disruptive to folks um as far as where where people live. I mean, that's just an interesting one to me in general. I, I, I'm definitely not for displacing people who are there, but it is a weird system, right? Where you have to, to enter a lottery and it might not be decades till you get a chance to live on the island. I, I'd be very interested to see kind of an audit of the demographics of the folks who, who do live there. I'm not sure if it would be fully representative of the city, but I think we can honor, hey baby, we can honor those pieces that are currently present while we expand, but I certainly wouldn't support either expansion of the airport or expansion of housing on the island. I think we can respect what's there, but I don't think more of it uh, is what we need and, and what we've been asked, at least myself, I've been asking for on this panel. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe we can uh, go to Yuma if you have any uh, reflections or thoughts on this. Um, sure, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, I want to jump back to Mark um, and just say thanks very much for the subscription. And I hope you continue on with the farming simulation videos. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, basically, I think I want to echo um, some more of Darren's thoughts, basically, in, in, in the interview that he gave. Uh, and just really lead with uh, always having an environmental impact uh, as like the front and center thing that needs to be thought about, um, whether it's like, you know, industry or expansion. I, I think his sentiments were very clear in that we can't leave it up to the politicians because, you know, I think they often bend to um, economy. They often bend to, you know, um, these decisions where they feel like they're doing the better for every, everybody, but in, in fact, you know, the, the land, the resources, the environment end up taking, you know, the brunt of, of, of most of that. Um, and, it, and it's, and it's kind of, it's tough to see, I guess. So, um, yeah, I think that the environment has to be a priority in any decision-making. And I think Indigenous people have to be front and center when that happens. Thank you. Um, Jen or, or Jacqueline, did you have any any thoughts that you'd like to share as well? Yeah, I would echo what Yuma is saying, is that um, we don't need more urban sprawl in Toronto. Um, respect what's there already, but if there's going to be any expansion of anything, it's expansion of green spaces by using native plants. It's attempting to um, re-naturalize a lot of the island. That would be the priority. And because the islands are the only kind of semi-wild green space that many Black and other people of color have access to in the city, as Kofi was saying, we don't have the cottages in Muskoka. We don't go to Algonquin Park because we feel unwelcome there. 
So if you can expand the green space in the city, that's to the benefit of all. And for most uh, Black and other people of color, urban nature is the only nature that we have access to. So the only nature, and if we're disconnected from urban nature, then we're really are not gonna care if the polar bear is drowned or if Algonquin Park um, is logged right out because it's too far removed from our experiences. But if we have access to more nature spaces and we have a better idea of what natural nature looks like, which sounds like an oxymoron, but if we have a better idea, oh, this is what nature looks like in the city and it's accessible to me, then more likely from that, we will start saying, oh, I need to protect this nature. And from there, you launch into the bigger need to make sure that the earth survives. Thank you. And of course, Jen, if you, if you would like to add anything as well, I wanna make sure we cover everyone. Yeah, definitely, thank you. I feel like, um, you know, reflecting on what everyone said, I, I don't have a ton more to add besides I don't think that the airport is, is doing much for, for green space or natural space, just to the points already raised. And, um, you know, there is so little space that we have um, writ large, a little space for, for queer gathering, for communities of color, for, for indigenous people. It just feels like it's um, like a waste of, of space that could be used otherwise. Great. Thank you for sharing. Um, we do have a couple more hands, but we, I recognize that we only have about four minutes left. So maybe this can uh, be our, our last question and I'll pass it off to uh, Ocean Luo. Your, your hand up has been up for, for quite some time. So I wanna make sure that we uh, address your question. So um, if, if Lo Ocean can be unmuted, please uh, and, and offer your question. Hi everyone, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Yeah, hi, hi. So first, uh, I'm so happy to see my planning school friend, Jen. <laughs> hi, how are you? <laughs> so uh, so I, I also am um, graduate from UBC planning school. I'm a planner right now in Boston, work with the Boston Planning Development uh, Agency as a senior planner. So my question is about, ask the project team, Have has the project team think about for, for this month's plan, so, uh, evaluation and monitoring process, does the team think about integrate indigenous knowledge in the monitoring process, not just use Western science data, think about indigenous knowledge, social, cultural perspective, storytelling, observation, oral entry, uh, oral tradition. So this is an example to see how the project team to consider indigenous knowledge in a decision-making process because also this also related to funding resources to support the rate program. I do want to see that if the project team have a think about this way, please consider these. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. That's very important. And it's uh, glad that you brought it up. Um, and and uh, thankfully, of course, the uh, part of the project team or members of the project team are, are, are listening in tonight as well. So I'm sure they're vigorously taking down notes as well. But as I did mention earlier, you know, the public engagement process will also pick back up uh, in, in the new year. So uh, make sure you you uh, you're active and, and you uh, keep track of, of what's what's to come. I'm sure more information will, will be there to come. Uh, so with that said, and we have two minutes left, so I do want to squeeze in just one, one, one last question and get to our last hand. Uh, Lin, uh, Lin, Linka, hopefully, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, but uh, hopefully we can uh, unmute Linka for the very last question of the evening. Linka, you should be unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. can. Welcome. Me? Yes. Hello, hello. Um, well, it was so interesting, so invigorating listening to all of you. Um, um, my basic point of view, obviously, it's also about environment. Um, it, it still seems to me there were so many people talking about environment, uh, yet it still seems to me that we are too much interested in ourselves, even now, you know, when uh, climate and biodiversity crisis obviously are our existential crisis, but we are still so much concerned with our identity, with our culture, with how we are going to enjoy ourselves. How about 
birds who are in free fall. Uh, Toronto and Toronto Island is one of those three places in Toronto, apart from Tommy Thompson and High Park, a lot designated for uh, accommodating most for birds migration. And, you know, all those our activities, when we are enjoying ourselves, kind of are in conflict with the way they need to provide themselves. So I was just wondering if we could all could not become more ecocentric as opposed anthropocentric. If this could not be our new culture that we would all share. That my, that this is my question. That's it. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your question. It's, it's an excellent one and it's an important one. Certainly um, thinking about, you know, uh, understanding that we all come also from different walks of life and we all engage with nature differently. And what does it mean to center that back into um, thinking about what these spaces might look like in the future? So um, maybe I can uh, refer to uh, Jacqueline if you have any thoughts or, or commentary on that. And, and of course, we can make our final round for all of the speakers uh, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll conclude for tonight. Yes, I'm also an avid bird watcher, and I absolutely agree that we need to make space for nature in the city because too often we see the city and nature as two separate things. And if we don't connect to nature in the city, then we're not going to connect to nature at all. So any kind of expansions on the island has to be grounded in protecting the nature spaces in one shape or form. And the leaders in that obviously have to be the indigenous because again, it's about respecting that ancient indigenous knowledge. Thank you. Um, maybe we can pass it over to Yuma. Do you have any additional thoughts to share? Um, yeah, I think uh, the to keep the conversation going, um, I think to go back to also the point that o Ocean was was mentioning, um, just about the approach, the, the two-eyed seeing approach. Um, and basically, you know, that's marrying indigenous science um, with Western science. Um, you know, I think a more general sort of way of saying it is uh, with the mindset of preservation, you know, some would see it as conservation, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's observations that have been, you know, uh, collected over millennia, basically on, on the land. Um, needing to be incorporated into uh, like a path forward for uh, the science, basically. Um, and yeah, I think that that was that was my only point. Thank you. Uh, and maybe we can pass it off to Kofi. Yeah, thank. I want to thank Lenka for that comment there. And I think it is, you know, there's really a yes end to this. The yes the importance of protecting our natural environments. And, and I agree, I think moving towards a culture which is more oriented towards an appreciation and protection of nature is key. But, you know, I think the le yes and is I think at the same time to build that new generation of conservationists, of folks who are passionate about nature. I go to what Jacqueline had said earlier. For many folks, you know, it's, it's very hard to have empathy for a concept. We know that, that when it's just something you read about in the book or see on television and, and what, unfortunately, animals, trees, water doesn't vote in our system. Human beings do. And the work that needs to happen around expanding conservation, around things to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, around the activities that will help undo some of the horrible damage we've done to the earth requires people who feel a passionate connection for these causes. And one of the ways we do that is through exposure to nature and people seeing their, as I said, their own story and their own culture connected to nature. So I think we have to do both. We have to conserve, but we also, for many folks who live in the city, who spend their time in towers, in cars, in heated indoor areas, we need to get them out more. We need to get them to experience and make great memories in nature because that's how you build the next generation of conservationists. So I think we have to, it's a walk and chew gum at the same time. We've got to protect these spaces, but we also have to get more people out into them. And I know it's a balance and attention, but I think that is essential if we're going to move forward, because otherwise people are not going to be willing to sacrifice 
just for something they read about in a book. That's just part of our limitation as human beings. You really have to see that personal connection to feel motivated to take an action to protect something. And I think Toronto Island can be critical in, in making that connection for many folks. Absolutely. Thank you, Kofi. And finally, Jen, you have the last word for the evening. It's a good timing because my headphones just, just died. So thank you for bearing with me <laughs> switching over here. Um, but definitely just want to um, think of kind of Cherry Beach is somewhere where I like to bird a lot when I was back in, in Toronto and area with a lot of cardinals and, and chickadees. And it seems like from what I remember of Cherry Beach, at least this um, and and or an and plus um, worked really well where you had people who were like myself there for for nature for birding at times there was also dancing and and events for people to um, also enjoy the beach in different ways i i just i hope optimistically that we can continue to balance both by also putting environment first recognizing that we do only have one one earth um, and also just to acknowledge my my friend and colleague ocean um, there was a um, a infamous placekeeping forum that took place previously, and uh, one of the elders, I believe, uh, Diane Longboat, spoke to um, wanting an ethical char charter in place that would put into law the preservation of Toronto Island as an Indigenous site. Uh, it just feels like uh, I, I hope beyond these great conversations, and, and thank you to the city and the panel for this discussion, just wanting to make sure that we're enshrining things in law and, and putting um, things in codified allocating budget making things happen beyond um, the master plan would be uh, something that I would emphasize. Great, thank you so much. And I think that's a great way to conclude tonight's forum. Um, there was certainly a lot to think about and thank you all for sharing again. And thank you all for, for submitting your questions and engaging in this conversation uh, very holistically. Uh, I, I, again, thank you for having me and, and uh, it was a pleasure to absolutely yeah, moderate and meet everybody as well. So with that, I'd like to pass it back over to Lori. Thank you, Galila. I was having trouble getting to my mute button because my hand is cramped <laughs> from so feverishly writing and trying to keep up with all the um, amazing thought and conversation. Um, so thank you to Yuma, Jen, Jacqueline, Kofi for um, all uh, and Galila for for your presentations and for moderating tonight. Um, this has been a really uh, invigorating discussion. Um, I, I, there's so many takeaways, but like focus on experiencing joy, making the island welcoming and starting that on the, at the Jack Layton Ferry side um, with information and knowledge to encourage people to explore. People can be intimidated in nature when they don't know where they're going. I myself would not go down a garden path or any sort of path if I kind of don't know where it's going. So if we really want people to go there and explore, we need to give them more information, consider ambassadors, um, you know, re-naturalizing some of the areas to, to celebrate dancing and, and music and the spirit of the place and the spirit that, uh, that moves people when they're there. The island seems to have a very, um, just an, a natural way of making people feel differently and whether that's just getting out into nature or escaping the stress of the city, it moves people in different ways, literally and figuratively. And um, I think it's important that we try to figure out how the master plan can help enhance that and embrace that, uh, especially towards uh, mutual respect and celebrating our differences and, and, and uh, sharing the, our strengths with one another. Um, opportunities for experiential learning in nature. That's, that again goes to that combined experience. We bond and we feel like we belong when we have that, co that combined experience in a place. And again, Toronto Island affords that opportunity because for many people across the city, um, who have not even never been down to the lake. I've heard stories of that. And, and I'm like, that it's just mind boggling me to think of that. that. We've got this massive lake right at the foot of our, our city. And there's so many people who have not been there and experienced it. And the island creates this opportunity for people to get there and experience nature, um, to celebrate urban nature so they can have a relationship and understand as stewards what they can do to contribute to climate change. They can see erosion happening and understand what erosion is and choose to um, become champions to fight erosion on Toronto, Toronto Island. Um, 
the, including indigenous uh, knowledge in the process and sort of blending Western and indigenous science into the thinking of it is certainly foundational in what we're doing. We have a lot of homework to do there, um, but we have been in, you know, engaging with elders and knowledge keepers and, and starting that process through the master plan. And I imagine that's gonna carry through, um, you know, well beyond the master plan being finished. Uh, I really appreciated Jacqueline, you, you, you keep kept referencing there is no planet B. Um, and, and, and there is no planet B. And so the thought that, you know, Toronto Island could start teaching people about how we can care for the environment, which contributes to the greater good of our entire planet overall is a pretty, pretty moving thought. Um, I also thought Kofi, when you were referencing the idea that, um, you know, people see a trip from Jane and Finch down to downtown Toronto, never mind the island, as going to a completely different planet. Um, the island is a different planet. It's not accessible to lots of people. And we need to figure out ways to change that, uh, both in, in the access of getting there, getting around the island, and, and how people see themselves in it or reflected in it. And that comes to celebrating culture, events, programs, um, who we partner with. Um, we need to stop looking at it through. I, I also like the reference to um, that insider lens um, and, and sort of a middle-class perception of it, uh, that we need to expand our thinking there and, and champion people within the community to lead on our behalf. Um, so that other people will be able to see themselves in those programs, and then we'll want to come there and participate. Um, you know, there was lots in the video, Yuma, uh, you know, about the land acknowledgement, making it uh, authentic and personal, um, considering, you know, uh, future governance models to, to collaborate and and having authentic representation of the indigenous community in the development of the plan, um, that it's, it's not being planned by others, that it's being planned together uh, and, and that will be authentically representative of the indigenous community and what they want to see there. And, and Jen, my takeaway from you is that I just wanna go to the island and dance, so. <laughs> You know, um, I, I thought that was just a really um, interesting comment uh, and, and the idea that, you know, uh, expanding some of the natural areas and, and uh, replacing a lot of the expansive grass over on the Hanlon side with, with uh, new plantings, indigenous plantings, um, and thinking really in a meaningful way about safety um, and not just at Hanlon's, and markers to identify safety, not just at Hanlon's, but across the island. So that, I mean, that doesn't sum it all up. There was a rich conversation here. Uh, and on behalf of the entire project team and the city, I just wanna say thank you to everyone. Um, if there's a call to action, it's that I simply say, please go to our, our uh, Toronto Island Master Plan website and look for future engagement opportunities. We welcome participation. There is going to be a, a public event uh, in February and we want people to participate and give us their insight on, on the plans that we're gonna be sharing. This is collaborative process and the finish line is until the end of the summer. So there's, there's lots of time to weigh in uh, and there's, we're, we're, it's an exciting time. We're, we're starting to actually put ideas on paper and we're gonna have some, what we're calling deep dive workshops um, in probably late February, March. And um, we can really roll up our sleeves and have some really more meaningful conversations like this. So um, thank you. Thank you. Really, really, really a meaningful conversation and so relevant to the master plan and our parks across the city. So thanks everyone. And thanks to all the participants who have joined tonight. Um, I know we, we had more at the start and, and it's natural that there's a little bit of uh, 
uh, people dropping off, but I hope uh, that people will come. Please, you know, share this with your networks and um, invite people to come back to the webpage to see the session uh, recorded.